I'm joined here today by crypto OG Anthony DiOrio. He is, of course, the CEO and founder of Decentral, CEO and founder of Jax. He's a co-founder of Ethereum. Thank you so much for chatting with me, Anthony. Pleasure to be with you today. What a little crypto can do. So this is part of my series called What is Blockchain? So let's launch straight into it. What is blockchain? Wow, you're going to get a number of different answers probably to that question, but uh-huh. it's, it's the, the most basic thing is the ledger system. It's a ledger that tracks transactions and it gets compiled into blocks and the blocks are put together and it creates a chain. And that's kind of the basic premise of people think, what is this blockchain stuff? You know what? It's nothing more than a ledger for tracking things. And then from that spurns on, you know, many other things from it. But for me, that's the most basic thing. It's a ledger for tracking digital assets. How would you define that to a child? First, I got to see, you know, there are some people that will not grasp this. So if, if I'm talking about my grandmother, who a uh, 94 year old grandmother, who's not on the internet and doesn't understand what the internet is, there's really no hope, I think, of explaining to them what blockchain is. Uh, and, and I don't think there's, there's really a purpose of doing that if they're not on the internet. Uh, for a child, the same situation. If they're not on the internet, don't understand what that is, it's going to be very difficult for them to understand. A, because maybe they don't even know what money is at this time, or they don't understand how things work like that. Uh, But if they do understand how the internet works, and how internet is for the movement of information, and when the internet came about, it completely changed and radically changed everything to do with the flow of information. Uh, And we use browsers in order to uh, navigate this internet. Well, things are turning digital. And with the internet, information turned digital. You could very quickly disseminate information around the world, uh, it changed things like publishing, it changed things like postal services, anything to do with the movement of information. Well, now, as the progression of digital things uh, proceeds, uh, money has turned digital, value has turned digital, assets, you can actually own something, prove ownership of it, move it from one person to another, it can't be duplicated. So that's what's emerged with these technologies starting from Bitcoin back in 2009 is the ability to manage and move digital value to have something that doesn't, uh, that can't be duplicated. That was a major breakthrough that Bitcoin brought us before Bitcoin, everything digital could be duplicated. And while that works great for information and disseminating information, it doesn't work well with things that have to have properties of money or things you want to prove scarcity. So when Bitcoin came on the scene, that's what it brought was the ability to move value and for an individual to own that value. And now that you can have something digital, something that can be spread across the world as easy as an email, and it gives people the ability to, to own their own assets and be in control of their lives. The way that Bitcoin has become this digital money for the digital age is really, really exciting. Is that what first attracted you to the blockchain industry and to Bitcoin in particular? So I, I, I was in decentralized systems, I, I, peer-to-peer file sharing for years and years. I, I was, you know, technology has been with me since I was eight, when I was building computers and then uh, I was on uh, communicating through modems before the internet. And then when the internet came about, I grasped it right away. I was building websites. So I've always been a technologist and followed new things coming along. So when Bitcoin came about, I've been spending the last couple of years studying economics and really digging into what had happened with the financial crisis, what had happened with the banking crisis, the real estate markets. And it really got me looking into what money was. And I really started studying the history of money. And it led me eventually to finding out and hearing about Bitcoin And then I put together the decades of my life of technology, of business, so I went to business school, of economics, and it enabled me to immediately grasp the power of these technologies. And that I understood right away the first day I heard about it, I could have the power to be my own bank. And that was really amazing. And that day I went out and bought my first Bitcoin at $9.73 Canadian back in 2012. Wow. (laughs) And I'm one of the few people, and I know Andreas, you know, has a, the law that says, you know, everybody hears it the first time, dismisses it, and then later on they hear, well, it wasn't with me. I, I, I heard about the first day, and because of my just recent studying of economics and sound money and my technology background, I was able to put it together. And then as an entrepreneur, I'm like, okay, how can I create value now? And what can I do because I'm so passionate, excited about where this could lead and how I understood it's more important than the internet because information is great, but value is going to, inter- it's going to intersect with so many other sectors. So it, I haven't looked back since, and it's about to me creating businesses, creating value. And I went right to building interfaces, building the wallets. I knew that the wallets were the way that we were going to navigate and manage and move our own value, just like a browser moves and manages information. So I started building wallets in 2013. And 
started building communities. So started the Toronto Bitcoin Meetup Group in 2012, really became a center of gravity here in Toronto and then in Canada and then globally speaking at conferences all around the world in 2012, 2013. That idea started coming towards me and that's where Vitalik brought me the white paper for Ethereum. And I funded the project uh, for a number of months leading up to the crowd sale. So it's a matter of you know a bunch of things coming together through my life that enabled me to understand the potential of these technologies the power to empower people to be in control of their lives, which is something that, you know, I've, I've never liked to be told, told what to do. And I've always thought it's better to be in control of things myself. So this enables us to be empowered with the tools and technology to be in control of our lives. And that's what the amazing thing I think is going to emerge from this. And this is what I saw very early on. I first met you, I think it was in 2014 at the Toronto Bitcoin convention just before Ethereum launched. And that was an incredibly exciting time. And it was evident even then just how much you were doing for community building uh, in the crypto space in general. So I remember that. We've got some pictures together, I think, with me, you and Vitalik. I yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The room that he spoke in. And yeah, that was in uh, April 2014 at the, 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 the Bitcoin Expo that we put on. Yeah, that was, that was such an amazing event. And then uh, you, you founded Decentral. What do you think is so important about decentralization? Decentral is a word that I came up with uh, when I was trying to set up a, a centerpiece in Toronto where people could come together and ideas could flow. But I didn't want to call it you know, Bitcoin Central because of the decentralized nature of Bitcoin. <laughs> I called it Bitcoin Decentral. Uh, and then when we started Ethereum, uh, I changed it to just Decentral because I recognized there was going to be more than Bitcoin. There's going to be other technologies out there. So we changed it from Bitcoin Decentral to Decentral. And why Decentral? Because we deal with decentralized technology. And, and I'm, I'm a big believer that in the future, and not so much now, I mean, decentralized technologies are, are on the rise. So, um, centralized systems have a lot of value in certain cases. I think technology needs to advance more for the real power of decentralized networks to really come full-blown across the world. But I'm a mid-ground person, and, I, and it's not all about getting there all at once. So I'm a decentralist, but I'm also a, a realist, and I think it's going to take time. So slowly and gradually, things will be moving uh, towards a decentralized world. But for now, I, I practice for leadership and for my business. I, I'm very centralized. I, I um, make fast decisions. I make the final decisions. Um, I can move very quickly because I don't have partners in my business. And I've been able to you know, say, I'm going to focus on decentralized technologies, but also there's, it's going to take time for the full power of these things to really come forward. So they're exciting. Uh, they remove a lot of central points of failure. There's a lot of security benefits that are going to emerge from these technologies. Uh, we're seeing right now a big focus on people thinking, why, why is my information in control of someone else's hands? So it's going to enable a lot more empowering of people's information and really taking control of one's lives, whether it be their money, their communications, uh, or their assets. So it's, 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 a, it's a movement that's happening. It's going to take a lot of time, but we're in the early stages of it. You mentioned before that you knew that Bitcoin wasn't going to be the only cryptocurrency. Others were going to come along. Why did you feel that way? I've never been a one or the other kind of mentality. Um, there's more than just black and white out there. And to think that Bitcoin being the first technology that comes out will be the be all and end all for everything, I, I don't think it's very, real, it, it, very, very realistic. Uh, the first technologies have first mover advantage, but innovation happens and new breakthroughs happen that, uh, that, that can provide new features with technologies that potentially old ones can't adapt and put in place just because of the way that they've been set up. So when we did Ethereum, I recognized the power of that and the power of smart contracts to go beyond what Bitcoin can, can do. So I identified that and not being a maximalist of any sort, you know, I'm, I'm all about innovation and moving things forward. And there could be hundreds of these things that provide value. And it's whatever provides value. If something's providing value, it's better than something else. To me, it would be silly to be stuck on the first thing or say that's the be-all and end-all. And I'm going to do whatever I can to protect that and nothing else. It's, it's the be-all and end-all. So no innovation matters. That's what I think everybody's going to go to. So that's not the way I look at things. I think uh, I, I see things on a wider scope, not so narrow. And if something has value, and it seems like other people are having value, and then if something else comes along, that will also could also be better. So Bitcoin was everything for me to start. Then when we did Ethereum, it opened my eyes to something more than Bitcoin. And then after Ethereum, you know, I continued that along and said, hey, why don't we support and create the interfaces and tools for all these technologies? And that's what JAX is. JAX is to be the interface 
for all these technologies so that we can create wins for everybody, support the best technologies. And if one of them fails, you know, what happens if Ethereum fails? You know, everybody that's put their eggs in that whole basket could be, uh, could be affected. I say, let's try and support all these technologies that competition is good and let's create value. And if it's something that comes out that's new, that, that wasn't there before, maybe that's something that people should be looking at. What do you think is the most important aspect of blockchain technology? Do you think it's currency? Do you think it's smart contracts? Do you think it's something else entirely? I think there's a number of benefits that are going to emerge from it. I think it's the ability to trust untrusted sources is, is a great thing. Uh, to be able to have relationships with someone based on laws and rules rather than the base and actually having to know them in the human factors of things is really interesting. Um, there's, there's a number of different things. Uh, and I think the, I think the fact that it's uh, combined a whole bunch of different elements from cryptography to decentralized networks all into these bundles of things that, 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 that were necessarily new, but have been brought together to create a lot of value is, is really interesting. What are the biggest hurdles in blockchain at the moment? Are they regulatory? Do you think they're government imposed? Are they social? Are they to do with technology? We have to get better tech all around. What is stopping mainstream adoption, for example? So a couple things. I think uh, the interfaces and user experiences and the education. So the average person is seeing that there's money being made in this. They don't fully understand what's going on. They have a fear of missing out, but they're not sure what's going, what's happening. There's just so much movement and it's moved so fast and so many different technologies. It's hard to, to corral everything. So education, I think the focus on education and informing people about what's happening and how it's going to impact their lives, their children's lives, the lives within, you know, in, in, the, in their work lives. I think education is extremely important technical limitations, scalability, being able to use these decentralized systems globally for everybody. We're not, that, we're not quite there yet, but we will be in the next few years. Um, government regulations, again, comes down to education. And uh, the more I find that regulators and governments are educated and understand the potential benefits of these technologies in tune to what the internet's brought us, that can, that can come across that 99.9% .9 of amazing beneficial things are gonna come to its people, two different sectors, a chance for new jobs and things. And yes, we'd be cognizant of the negative aspects, but to really focus on the benefits that they, that, and the, the, the ground that can be broken in this global world that people can, can uh, grasp and understand and then get a competitive edge on their neighbors is what I think governments and regulators could be focusing on. What role do you think government has in regulating blockchain tech? I think the role right now is educating themselves and trying to do what's going to create the most amount of value for their, for their people. Uh, there's, there's, there's always benefits and negative things that come out of radical or that come out of uh, groundbreaking technologies, disruptive technologies. And the first step should be aligning with the people that are understanding where the future will be and then starting to work backwards. So if you look in the future and say, these technologies will be there, the anonymity will be there. It's, it's going to happen. The trajectory of the technology is, is vertical, whereas the trajectory of being able to regulate something like this is pretty flat. So if we can get them understanding that it's not about controlling people anymore, it's not about trying to control the system, because if you do that, other countries who are going to allow more freedom in the things that they're doing will be the ones succeeding. If it can be, hey, we, we know this is coming. How do we think about this differently? How do we deal with something that we've never dealt with before, but maybe not do it in the same way we've always done, which is regulate, regulate, regulate. I think educate inform bring in the key players that are that that are that are grasping down the road where it will be and try to come up with strategies and plans that will mitigate the negative aspects but still ensure the great things that will merge out of this to flourish i think that's the focus of governments and regulators now in the future as you're looking forward do you see bitcoin becoming a world currency or do you think it will always be a specialty product i think bitcoin or something like bitcoin has the potential to be a world currency as do many other currencies uh, it's removed the friction involved with uh, cross-border payments. And I could say maybe Bitcoin has its own friction points, but other technologies are emerging that are solving a lot of the problems, privacy problems, uh, scalability problems. All this thing is emerging, I think. And the amount of innovation and open innovation that's occurring on these networks will enable technologies like Bitcoin, decentralized technologies, and it could be a few different currencies, but to be global systems that don't show sea borders, that don't uh, have time delays that everybody has access to and doesn't need any onboarding system to the billions around the world that don't have access to financial systems. I think it's just a matter of time. And I see government currencies right now as intranet systems in a world where the internet is gonna flourish. I also look at these systems as just information. They're ones and zeros, it's data. 
uh, and data, just like information, wants to be free. So to try and restrict things within borders, which is what has generally been the the the, the, the task that, that the governments have done, I think is going to fall the wayside and eventually that, that will be the door to more open things across borders. And yes, global currencies or global systems for value transfer. You said that you first got involved in the blockchain industry because of your understanding of economics and sound money. So in your opinion, what gives Bitcoin value? I think what gives a Bitcoin value is what people are willing to buy and sell it for and the utility of what it offers. Um, it, it's, 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 it's digital way, digital cash, digital way to move value, to prove ownership of something that can be sent from one person to another globally instantly in a system that doesn't require onboarding, that doesn't require people to be onboarded into a system that's not controlled by any central authority, any particular government. There's a number of values that things that combine to, um, that, that combine to show that it's strength and, and as more people recognize its utility, the more it tends to grow because as it's fixed and limited supply, the value goes up. It's just a matter of economics and it's, we've seen that happen year after year. If blockchain were never invented, what would you be doing right now? Oh, wow. I don't know. I've never thought about that. I'm just so glad that it had been invented and it's been right. to me and I've enjoyed every minute of what I've been doing here. It's been six years, longer than I've ever done anything in the past in one particular sector. So it's been really amazing. And I really don't know what I would be doing in the space if it wasn't for this. Definitely some, probably something computer related. I've just been technology all my life, but um, I don't know. Good question. <laughs> well, we're just grateful that uh, Bitcoin was invented and you are in the space because you're doing tremendous good. So just wrapping up now, what do you see in the future for Bitcoin? What does the future look like in, in 10 years time? Well, for Bitcoin, not necessarily, but for the whole space, I think uh, in the future, we'll look back and, and look at the system we have now and the system that's always been and say, wow, I couldn't believe that, that we treated value any differently than information. Just like when information was taken out of the hands of governments, when the printing press and things came about, you know, there's a whole shift that happens. And I think the same thing will happen where governments will realize, hey, you know, it's pretty silly that we're trying to control value within our borders. And information wants to get out there and be free. So I think down the road, people will look back and say, wow, I can't believe that this is the way that things operated. And that you know, it's, it's ridiculous to have something that has to be restricted and have so much friction points and to have different types of currencies and all these different things that are that, that just are not very um, efficient. So I think that's probably the biggest thing. We'll come back and we'll say, wow, look at the impact that this has had on, on so many different sectors. And it's because of the genesis of Bitcoin and the thinking of putting these all things together that's led to it. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me and thanks for everything that you're doing and everything you've created in this space. My pleasure, thanks for having me. Subscribe to the channel. Yeah, subscribe to Naomi's YouTube channel. <laughs> Best endorsement ever.